Well, hello and welcome to the first of our Meet the Experts webinars for 2024. My name is Julia Priestley and I'm one of the joint CEOs of the British Thyroid Foundation. This is the first time we've held a webinar that focuses on well-being and I'm delighted to welcome three excellent speakers who between them who have many years experience of looking after and supporting people with thyroid and other long-term conditions. Thyroid disorders usually present with physical symptoms, and for most people, fortunately, these can be managed well by the standard medications. But having physical good health is not the only way to measure our qualities of, the quality of our lives. The, the psychological symptoms that accompany thyroid disorders can also have a huge and distressing impact on people of all ages. And thank goodness these are now talked about and acknowledged, even though there isn't always an easy way to manage them. But well-being is something different, again, and so I'm really looking forward to hearing our experts explain more to us about how we can define well-being, how it might relate to or interact with thyroid disorders and its symptoms, and what small steps we can all take to improve how we feel that we cope with the everyday, uh, to cope with improving the well-being of our day-to-day -day lives. So without any more from me, I'm delighted to hand you over to Greta Lyons, who is one of our wonderful trustees. Greta is a research nurse at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge, and she has a wealth of experience looking after and working with people and families living with thyroid disorders. Greta will introduce our fantastic speakers to you in a moment. Please write any of your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and as many as we can get through will be put to our speakers after the presentations. We have a big audience, so if we don't get round to your question, you can always contact the BTF after the event and we'll do our best to answer them for you. So over to you, Greta. Thank you, Julia. Uh, welcome to our um, webinar. I realise that there's quite a few people that have registered for this webinar, so I will apologise in advance. I will do my very best to look at all of your um, questions to the panellists um, and um, it may be that I need to take a, a general flavour of, of certain topics that come up. Um, as you can see, there's 130 odd participants at the moment. So if I don't get around to um, asking the panellists your question, um, then I apologise. Um, so tonight's panellists, we have um, Dr. Carla Moran, who's a consultant endocrinologist with um, vast experience in thyroid disorders, um, and she will be um, kicking off our session. And then after that, we will be passing over to Sue Jackson, who is a chartered psychologist who's done um, a lot of um, work with the BTF and concentrates on um, areas of uh, people with long term conditions. Um, so I am sure you'll agree by the end of this, we should have a, um, a really good basis for looking at how to keep ourselves well. So I'm going to pass over to Dr. Carla Moran. Thank you. Thank you, Greta. So I'm sharing my slides. Hope everybody can hear me okay and see those slides well. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many people have dialed in to hear a little bit about well-being and thyroid disease because I think it's a really important topic. Thyroid disease is really common, mostly affects women and although we can treat it, I think some patients feel that their well-being isn't optimal after they've had thyroid disease and in most cases that's transient so it only happens for a short while but uh, sometimes it can go on for longer than that and really impact somebody's quality of life. So this is an important topic. What I've decided to go over with you today is a little bit of background. So I'd like to just talk a little bit about thyroid hormone and what it does. And I'll briefly give an introduction to common thyroid diseases. So the most common thyroid diseases that we see are overactive thyroid problems or an underactive thyroid. So I'll speak about both of those. And then lastly, then I'll come around to speaking a little bit about well-being with thyroid disease 
and how I view somebody could optimize their well-being, either from a general health point of view or, you know, if you're also suffering from, from thyroid disease, which may impact your well-being. So what is thyroid hormone? Thyroid hormones are made in the thyroid gland, which is a small butterfly-shaped gland in the front of the neck. And the technical term for thyroid hormones are T4 and T3. The thyroid gland mostly makes T4, but makes a small amount of T3. And they circulate around in the bloodstream and they have effect on many parts of the body, which I'll show you now. The thyroid hormones also circulate back to a little gland in the brain called the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland is only about the size of a pea and it makes lots of different hormones. But one hormone it makes is called TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. And the pituitary is very sensitive to circulating thyroid hormone levels. And if it detects that the thyroid hormone levels are too low, it increases its TSH signal. And the TSH is a way of the pituitary sending a message to the thyroid to say, please make more thyroid hormone. If the thyroid gland is making too much thyroid hormone, the TSH signal is switched off. And that's an indirect way of the pituitary trying to communicate with the thyroid to stop making thyroid hormone thyroid hormones. Thyroid hormone is really essential for life and it has effects on almost every part of the body. In the liver, for example, it controls how we uh, metabolize cholesterol. In the heart, it controls the frequency of our heartbeat and how strongly our heart contracts. It has an effect on gut motility and it does that by changing the way the muscles within the gut contract. It also affects our bone turnover. Our, the mineral in our bones is constantly turning over with it being broken down and then being relayed. And the balance of that is affected by thyroid hormones. Thyroid hormones also affect our muscle strength and they're very important as well for our brain development and our brain health following completion of brain development. One of the most common thyroid diseases is an overactive thyroid gland, and it's probably the most common thyroid condition that I look after in clinic. When we talk about an overactive thyroid gland, what we mean is that the thyroid gland is making too many thyroid hormones. And we use other terms, and sometimes that can be confusing, so I just wanted to, to describe those for you. We sometimes use the term of a hyperactive thyroid, or a thyrotoxicosis, or hyperthyroidism. And in practical terms, really, we use these terms interchangeably to mean an overactive thyroid gland. So if you see these terms, um, try not to be confused. If somebody develops an overactive thyroid gland, they'll usually develop symptoms. And the symptoms vary from one person to the next. But common symptoms include excessive sweating, neck swelling, sometimes changes in the eyes, weight loss, Patients will feel warm overall, but often have warm palms. They may feel anxious and have irritability. They'll often feel a little bit restless and they might notice emotional changes. They might have noticed that they're more tearful, for example. Sleep is often affected and the patient might be aware of a rapid heart rate or an increased awareness of their heart rate. And that's, a, that's what we call palpitations. Somebody might also have noticed a tremor. The most common cause of an overactive thyroid is thyroid gland is called Graves' disease. And it has a rather worrying name, distressing name for patients if they're told that they have this condition, but it's named after the physician who described it many years ago called Robert Graves. It mostly affects women and it tends to affect us in our 20s, 30s, 40s, but it can happen at any age. Graves' disease is what we call an autoimmune disease. So that means that our immune system has mounted a response to part of our body. And in Graves' disease, what happens is our body makes a tiny little protein called an antibody. And these antibodies are recognized by the thyroid gland. And in response to these antibodies, the thyroid gland tends to get enlarged and it makes too many thyroid hormones. And it does this persistently as long as this antibody is there. The technical term for the antibody is TSH receptor antibody, or sometimes it's abbreviated to be called a TRAB. And the presence of the TRAB is really the hallmark of Graves' disease. There are other causes of an overactive thyroid gland, and these include thyroiditis, which is inflammation within the thyroid gland, which often settles by itself. 
Patients can sometimes have what's called a toxic nodule. Toxic just means that it's making hormone or it's thyrotoxic. And the nodule is sometimes termed an adenoma. And that's really a lump in the thyroid gland that's making too much thyroid hormone. People can develop what's called a toxic multinodular goiter. So goiter just means an enlarged thyroid gland. Multinodular means there's a number of different nodules or lump within the gland. And toxic means that thyroid hormone levels are high. If we suspect that somebody has an overactive thyroid gland, we take blood tests. And the typical tests we'll measure are TSH, T4, and sometimes also T3. And what we'll see is that the T4 and T3 levels are high. And in the face of those high thyroid hormone levels, the TSH signal is very low. And we sometimes use that the, the term as uh, the fact that it's suppressed. In other words, it's not detectable at all. And the pattern I've illustrated here is a very typical pattern of somebody with an overactive thyroid gland. There are various ways that we can treat an overactive thyroid gland. Most commonly, we start with a medication called an antithyroid drug. And patients are usually on this medication for between nine and 18 months, sometimes longer. There's about a 50% chance that after they go through that course of treatment that they'll remain in remission. In other words, their thyroid hormone levels will stay normal forever. A small number of people don't respond and some of these medications are not safe in pregnancy. They can rarely cause serious side effects. Other options for treatment are a treatment called radioiodine treatment, which is a once-off capsule that a patient swallows, and it contains iodine that has integral to it some radiation activity. That's taken up within the thyroid gland, and it kills off the cells that are making too much hormone. It's very effective, but there is a high risk of the person developing an underactive thyroid gland or hypothyroidism. And it's not safe in pregnancy or somebody who has significant thyroid eye disease. Another option for treatment is surgery, and this is where the whole thyroid gland is removed. And this will be curative for the patient, but they will develop hypothyroidism. And because we're aware of that, we put them on thyroxine therapy to replace their thyroid hormone immediately after surgery. There's a possibility of some complications from surgery, which we discuss with people prior to them making their decision for the best treatment for them. So moving on now to an underactive thyroid. An underactive thyroid is often termed hypothyroidism. And untreated hypothyroidism usually results in symptoms, but not always. The common symptoms are weight gain, intolerance to cold, low mood, hair loss, slow heartbeat, which usually the patient's not aware of, but we might pick up on examination. Constipation is frequent, menstrual changes, in particular heavy menstrual flow, fatigue is common, and joint pain may also be experienced. The most common reason for a thyroid gland to become underactive is a condition called Hashimoto's thyroiditis, again named after the physician who described it. Hashimoto's thyroiditis is also an autoimmune condition. And here the body has made antibodies that cause destruction of some of the cells within the thyroid gland. So the difference here between Hashimoto's and Graves' disease is that the antibodies in Graves' disease don't actually destroy the gland. Um, but the antibodies in Hashimoto's seem to bring about destruction of the thyroid gland. These patients develop hypothyroidism, and we'd pick these up on blood tests, which I'll show you in a moment. There are other reasons why the gland can become underactive. So it can happen if we remove the thyroid gland at surgery, or if we give radioiodine therapy, as I've recently mentioned, and medications can cause hypothyroidism as well. The typical blood tests we see are that the T4 and T3 are low, and the TSH level is very high because the pituitary gland is sensing the hormone levels are low and it's trying to tell the thyroid gland to make more hormone, but the gland can't do that because of Hashimoto's or one of the other reasons I've mentioned. If you've, if you've been diagnosed with underactive thyroid gland, your blood test might have, might have only been slightly abnormal at the time of diagnosis. And this is what we call subclinical hypothyroidism. And here what we see is that T4 and T3 are within the normal range, but the TSH level alone is abnormal. It is a little bit elevated. We term that subclinical hypothyroidism, and um, usually patients are less affected by symptoms, 
and uh, we view it as an early form of, of hypothyroidism. So we treat an underactive thyroid gland by replacing the thyroid hormone. So we replace T4, and that's available in tablet form called thyroxin. It's sometimes called levothyroxin. There are various brands available, but they're all very similar and they all contain thyroxin. Usually, as I mentioned, when somebody starts thyroxin therapy, their TSH level is, is very elevated. And so what I've shown here is a typical response to thyroxin therapy in terms of the changes in the laboratory tests. So the TSH starts off as high, and after somebody's on thyroxin, the TSH falls. The blue box that's shaded at the bottom indicates the normal range for the TSH. So we'd expect the TSH to come down into the normal range. T4 at diagnosis is often, but not always, low. And after we start thyroxin, we expect to see the T4 come up into the normal range. And it often comes up into the upper end of the normal range. The normal range for T4 is shaded here in light orange. So that's what we expect to see. And we hope to see it fairly quickly after diagnosis. And we aim to keep the hormone levels normal in the long term to try and minimize the person's symptoms. So for the last little bit of my talk, I wanted to focus a little bit on well-being in the, in the setting of thyroid disease. And when I think about well-being, I often think about the definition of health that's provided from the World Health Organization. So they define health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So really, we should be aiming for a very good standard of health and well-being when we're treating our patients with thyroid disease. But it's worth mentioning that often in the general population, one would not feel of optimal well-being at certain times in our life. So, for example... We might feel a bit under the weather with work, not being able to face work, overcome with anxiety or, or problems with our mood, or just feel kind of generally down in the dumps. And that's really common in the general population. And those feelings come and go. But of course, people who have thyroid disease may also at times have periods of suboptimal well-being in their lives. And in my clinical practice, I often see that patients are treated for their thyroid disease, but they might have some persistent symptoms. And in general, thankfully, after we treat thyroid disease, patients' lives go back to normal. But there's certainly a subset of people whose symptoms seem to persist for a little longer. And common things that patients would say to me would be concerns regarding their weight, that they have ongoing levels of, of increased fatigue and low energy, and that they might have problems with brain fog. So on top of being at risk of having suboptimal well-being, they then may also have these additional symptoms from their thyroid disease. When I see a patient in my clinic who's coming back to me, maybe who has a diagnosis of thyroid disease, and I think, great, I've put them on the right treatment and everything looks good, they might say to me that they just don't feel quite right. And I think what they're describing to me is that their well-being is poor. And they'll often use terms like this. They feel that I'm, I've improved, but I'm only 70% there, or I'm below par, or I'm just not right. I'm not running on all cylinders. And if they're feeling really poorly, they might say something like, you know, doctor, I just feel like the wheels are coming off. So there might not be a specific symptom that they can hang their hat on, but they might be just trying to say to me, you know, I just don't feel quite right. And I think what they're describing to me is that their, their well-being has been affected and is still affected. So when I see somebody like that, there's a few things that run through my mind. So the first thing I'll do is I'll look back over their thyroid history and the medication they're on and the results. And I'll think to myself, well, is everything going as expected, but it's just going to take a little bit longer. And we often see that. So sometimes the biochemistry gets better. So the lab results look right, but the symptoms might be going on a little bit longer. And often if we, if, if we think that that's what's going on, sometimes just having a discussion about that and discussing certain lifestyle changes that can be done to optimize one's well-being really puts somebody then in a better stead to feel better overall. Um, I think to myself whether the dose is right and I take somebody's symptoms into consideration when I'm deciding whether the dose is right. 
And we chat a little bit about the medication and whether that's being taken correctly. And um, and sometimes it's just simple things like that that might be affecting their well-being. I always think whether I might be missing another medical problem. Um, it's possible that something might have cropped up. So I'll think about things like, am I missing anemia, for instance, or a vitamin deficiency? Or if I'm seeing a woman at the right age for menopause, maybe has menopause started, and is that what's bringing on these symptoms? So I'll always have a little think about whether that might be at play. And it has been shown in the past that if patients with thyroid disease have a negative healthcare experience, that they can have a reduction in their quality of life. So sometimes I'll explore that a little bit. Um, maybe if they'd had a questions from a previous consultation with me, or if they've had a, a negative experience in the past, maybe they might want to just talk a little bit about that and that can help them. But if I've done all of that and I haven't really found a reason or any way to particularly help somebody, then I think it's really helpful for me to take a step back and take a broader view. Because I think sometimes we can be too simplistic in our view. And when we think about ourselves as humans, we are just inherently complicated. And um, it's not just our, our physical health we need to think about, we need to think about psychological health, our emotional, our emotions, how things are at home, how things are at work. So we're extraordinarily complex. And I think that our well-being doesn't just come down to what the TSH level is. Yes, that's very important, but I think that often will not be the only answer as to why somebody's not feeding quite right. And so when I'm trying to ask them how things are in other dimensions of their life, I find this wellness wheel to be helpful. So the wellness wheel is a tool that was described almost 50 years ago, and it's used really to assess well-being in different dimensions of our lives. So it comes back to this holistic view of not purely just thinking about one's physical health, but other dimensions of our life. So physical health is important, but what about things like occupational health? How are we doing in work? Are we enjoying work? Are we overloaded with work? Are we very stressed with regard to work? Our intellectual health. So are we doing things that give us energy, that inspire us, that capture our imagination, that we enjoy? So we typically think of, of hobbies as providing that kind of, that kind of support to our well-being. Financial considerations are important. So if somebody is very stressed, worried about how they're going to pay the bills, that will really impact on their general well-being. Emotional health is important. So how do we see ourselves? How is our self-esteem? What's our relationship with ourselves? Are we nurturing ourselves and our, our well-being? Spiritual health can be important to consider. And social um, interactions are also really important. And I'll come back to that when I'm talking a little bit about stress. So I try to have a discussion with patients about the lifestyle changes that we can all do that will promote our well-being. And we do talk about exercise and activity. And the recommendations is that we should all be active. And most of us probably aren't meeting this, myself probably included. We should aim for 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week. And we should also be trying to do some strengthening exercise. And Sometimes I hate talking about this or bringing this up with patients because I think, you know, everybody groans. Yes, doctors are always talking about exercise. They're always talking about stopping smoking. They always say the same things. But physical activity is hugely important. And there are multiple proven benefits of exercise. So to name just a few, it's been shown to improve our brain health. So it reduces depression, anxiety. It improves our cognition and so can reduce brain fog. It reduces the likelihood that we'll develop diabetes or cardiovascular disease, reduces our risk of stroke. It improves our bone health, so reduces the likelihood that we'll develop osteoporosis. It improves our muscle strength, so we're less likely to be frail as we get older, and that's really important. Um, it reduces the severity of infection, so if we get pneumonia or COVID-19, it's been shown that, if, that we, if we're exercising regularly, we're less likely to have a severe consequence from those infections. And it reduces the risk of multiple cancers. And to name just a few, breast, bladder, colon, gastric, esophageal, endometrial, and others. 
And so when I talk to, to my patients about exercise and activity, I try to tell them it's not just about weight management. I think we need to get away from thinking that the only reason anybody exercises is to lose weight. We should be staying active to promote our physical, mental well-being, our general well-being anyway. So I'd strongly encourage you to try and consider uh, making sure that you exercise. Sleep is also really important. And I'm constantly surprised when I ask people how their sleep is, how poor their sleep is. They're only sleeping for a few hours <clears throat> and then they're tired during the day, they have brain fog. So sleep is really important. And there's a concept with which I'm sure you're familiar, which is termed sleep hygiene. So these are all the things that we should be doing to try and optimize our sleep. So sleep quantity is important, but sleep quality is also important. We should be aiming for seven to nine hours of sleep per night, which seems like a lot. But even if we get to the seven, that's really good. And it's important that we sleep in the right environment. So comfortable bed, the right temperature, not too hot, sleeping in silence and in the dark. Try not to eat for at least two hours before we go to bed. Don't drink any alcohol for three hours before we go to bed and try to avoid caffeine for eight hours before we go to bed. Physical activity makes a difference and also being exposed to natural light in the morning tends to really help with our internal body clock. So think about that and try to avoid the screens uh, before going to bed. There's good information on how to sleep well from the Royal College of Psychiatrists. So uh, if you wanted to read more, you could do that through their website. And the other things that are really important, I think, is to consider stress. And there's so many sources of stress in our life. We won't be able to avoid stress altogether. And there's some forms of stress, actually, that are you know, benefic beneficial for us. But if we can't manage the stress, then things do really affect our general well-being. So it can be helpful, I think, to think a little bit about where the source of stress is. Is it work? Is there poor health in the family that you're worried about? Financial issues, which I've talked about briefly. Um, is somebody grieving? That's a huge source of stress and poor well-being, of course. How are people's relationships? Are they, are they caring for young children or do they have children perhaps who have additional needs and that's causing some stress for them? Are they also caring for their parents? Um, and what are their relations like, relationships like with their partner? And do they have good friends that they can talk to? Um, how are their work-life balance? Do they get time for themselves? Do they do things that they enjoy? And how is their mood and their anxiety? So sometimes just talking a little bit about stress can kind of focus the mind on where the sources of stress might be. And then it can help somebody then try to address those. So that's a summary of the things that I've mentioned. And of course, the other thing that is really important that I haven't spoken about is a healthy diet. So a healthy, balanced varied diet and getting the basics right is really important. Having breakfast, lunch and dinner, uh, making sure you set time to sit down and have your food. Try not to snack in between, but choose healthy snacks. And uh, those things seem very basic, but they make a big difference. There are helpful resources and some of those I've included in the slides so far, but there are uh, lots of help. There's lots of helpful information and other webinars available from the British Thyroid Foundation. Here's just some of them and helpful information as well on psychological symptoms and thyroid disorders, which I think Sue was involved in drafting for, for the BTF. So I thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the Q&A session later on. Thank you very much, Carla. Um, I'm going to hold all questions for the time being. I've um, written quite a few down. Um, there seems to be some general areas where of commonality. Um, so we are now going to move on to um, Sue, who will now uh, give us a, a further in-depth look at um, how we can look after ourselves. Thank you, Sue. Yay, hopefully you can, oh yeah, it's just told me that participants can now see the screen, yay. Um, okay, so I'm going to pick up on some of the things that um, Carla has just been talking about. Um, I'm going to start by looking at psychosocial impact of illness. I'll move on to talk about um, energy management, how we can manage um, our energy um, and strategies for improving well-being. Um, 
So um, on the left there, you've got a little little set of bubbles. Um, some of you might recognize it if you've had cognitive behavioral therapy, um, you might recognize it because it's known as the hot cross bun. Um, it's the four areas that stress or illness can affect us. Um, usually we write stress in the middle, but actually illness it can be, or not feeling well, having poor well-being, having poor quality of life. Those things can affect us. They're a form of stress. And so you can replace the word in the middle with whatever it is that's bothering you and then look at the how does it make me think what thoughts go through my head about the, the way I'm feeling. Um, physiology of body states. Carl has already talked a lot about that in terms of um, thyroid conditions. Illness also um, changes our behavior. Um, so what we say, what we do, um, because we're, we're not feeling the way that we would um, or that we have been feeling before. Um, and also it changes how we feel. And it's not just the um, poor quality of life or the not feeling 100% or whatever. Um, there can also be some feelings of guilt and shame around um, having a condition, particularly one that fluctuates. Um, you may not know how you're going to feel day on day, whether today's a good day or not a good day, and neither will the people around you. Um, and that means that sometimes the choices that you can make or want to make aren't always possible. And that can have a kind of a knock on effect, if you like, those things affect each other. So how you're feeling, what you're able to do, what you want to do, whether you can do it or not can affect how you think about yourself, change your relationship with yourself and also how you, you feel about yourself. So we have that box on the right there. We kind of got some very difficult words in there around how someone might be feeling um, if um, their well-being is not great and they're having a hard time managing their condition. You might be wondering what's the toy box at the top. Um, so... Sometimes with my clients, one of the things that I talk about is, is the toy story. Um, and it's about the process of coming to understand what it's like to live with a chronic health condition. Um, so the, the toy story basically goes that there is a toy that is incredibly popular. Um, and it's always being played with and it's always very busy. And then one day it wakes up and it finds it's on the shelf in the cupboard. And it's really not happy about being on the shelf in the cupboard. And it tells everyone how unhappy it is about being on the shelf in the cupboard. And eventually one of the other toys who's been on the shelf before talks to the toy that's new to the shelf um, and basically says, this is really, really important time for you. Time on the shelf is, is what you make it. Um, but it can be really important and very transformative and it can help you in terms of your performance when you're back out of the cupboard and back in the playroom again. Um, and the, the toy kind of has a think about this and talks to some other toys and eventually there comes the day and the door opens and someone takes the toy off the shelf and the toy shouts as he leaves the shelf, I'm not ready to leave the shelf yet because he'd worked out how to be on the shelf. Now there was some interesting research back in the mm, 90s when chronic fatigue was kind of a, a new thing, chronic fatigue syndrome or um, ME as it's also known. Um, and there was a researcher called William Collins and he was writing about what it's like to have a condition that causes you to have brain fog, to have fatigue that reduces what you can do. And he said, it's one of the hardest changes that, that humans can make. If you're used to doing lots and lots of things and you're used to being busy and you kind of don't take a second thought about what you can and can't do, having to make that change to understand what life is like for you now and what it might be like going forward and whether it might change in the future or not. He's saying it's one of the hardest things that humans can do, understanding how to be on the shelf, how to be a witness to other people doing things rather than necessarily being the one that's doing everything all the time. In our culture, we have a big push for doing, doing lots of things, but actually there, there is a place for the people who witness and who are who applaud us in our endeavours and so on. There is a lot to value about being on the shelf, but it's not something we ever really talk about. Um, and so people end up feeling that they ought to be doing and that makes them like the toy. They're really not happy about being on the shelf. Um, 
I've been on the shelf a few times myself through my life. Um, each time it has been transformative, but it takes some some getting used to. It's not necessarily an easy thing. Um, and I think part of the reason it's not an easy thing is because of our societal roles about what it means to be not well. Um, so we have this thing called the sick role, which was um, first... Actually, I suppose documented as a thing in the in the seventies um, by someone called um, he's a sociologist called Talcott Parsons, um, and he did some research around what does it mean for people to be unwell, um, and if you're sick, then there is this the, the the description on the left. So you have an exemption from daily activities, you have symptoms, and they must be recognised by other people. There is this sense that you want to get better and that you're seeking professional help, and not only that, you're actually um, complying with professional help, you're taking your medication, you're doing the things you're supposed to be doing. The problems with that is that it means that if you have a chronic condition, um, you can feel like your behaviour is being scrutinised and you're being judged for whether you're being compliant or not. It can feel quite uncomfortable. If your functioning is less than optimal, less than you want it to be, there can be quite a lot of distress around that. And it can cause tensions within relationships. So I think the sick role, the way we tend to think about the sick role is appropriate for things like a broken arm and a cold and about a flu or something like that. It doesn't really apply to chronic health conditions, but we don't have another, another way of describing and helping people to understand. We just have this. And even this is kind of, it's within the um, academic literature I, it isn't really within it's just it's an unspoken thing within our within our culture um which doesn't help so psychologists think of chronic health conditions as what we call a, um, a biographical disruption again this was another sociologist called Burry in the 1980s who suggested this this idea that actually your life is going along and there's a whole lot of things that given where you are in your life course, you may be expecting to do, but you haven't necessarily actually articulated them. They're just sort of in the back of your mind, their expectations about how your life might go. And then you are diagnosed with a chronic health condition and all bets are off. You, you're not sure anymore what your life course will be, what it will look like. And that's actually quite difficult for people. Um, and people can need some support around that. Um, so there are some psychologists who are doing some research to try and understand what kind of help would be beneficial to help support people who are going through um, or living with some kind of chronic health condition to kind of help them to navigate um, their change in their life course. Um, so one of the big issues for individuals with chronic health conditions or varying kinds, not just thyroid conditions, although I appreciate this is a, a thyroid um session thyroid focus session um lacking in energy that feeling of, of fatigue so back during the pandemic which feels like a long time ago now but actually isn't all that long ago really um there were a lot of people kind of name checking understandably anxiety and depression um and saying oh people's mental health is, is really bad and i was thinking that's true but anxiety and depression are useful descriptions of how people are feeling but it doesn't actually describe why they're feeling that like that and I, I did a lot of reading during the pandemic um, and Charles Dickens and Edgar Allan Poe both use in initiation this word that I came across and I was intrigued by it so I went and I looked it up and did some research around it um, and discovered it's really useful and um, so it's it's um, defined there a lack of vigor vitality or enthusiasm due to a lack of nourishment also known as starvation in brackets, um, be that social, physical, mental, or spiritual in nature. So inanition is starvation of the things that would feed you in some way, shape, or form. So I was talking to one of my colleagues about this, and she said, oh, it's your soul food. It's being starved of your soul food, because quite often if you have a health condition that reduces your energy levels and causes brain fog and pain and, and various other, other things, it means that you you have to make difficult choices about where you put the time and energy that you do have. And lots of us then, we've got bills to pay, we've got obligations to other people to meet. And so we end up prioritising activities of daily living, like keeping the house clean and such. And the things that actually may feed us more meaningfully, like our hobbies, our interests, playtime, that kind of thing, 
that there isn't time for those. And so we end up starved of things that, that really matter to us. Now, there are these four different domains in which we can need feeding. However, everyone is different and the particular mix of things that you need will be unique to you and how you need to be fed will also be unique to you. Um, so social and emotional energy, for instance, some people are party animals and thrive around other individuals, but not everyone is. Sometimes you need time away by yourself. Um, and it's okay to feel like that, to need some time and space to kind of um, put yourself together, if you like. I know I certainly need a certain amount of time to myself every single day. Otherwise, I go a little bit um, strange. Um, at the bottom there, there's a little little message that's very important. So starvation or inanition is best treated with small amounts of nourishment. So one of the things I noticed when we had the bounce back after the pandemic, and one of the reasons I am so such an advocate of this word as a useful description of what people experience, is that people say, well, I'm back out and I'm doing things and I don't feel any better. If anything, I feel worse. And that's because if you overdo it, if you overdo the good things, that's not good for you. So Inanition is best treated with small amounts of nourishment judiciously administered over a prolonged period of time. A banquet of anything, no matter what that anything is, is not good for us. So it needs to be balanced. OK. So the other thing that can also happen and the thing that I hear quite a lot um, is people kind of doing the, the boom and bust cycle. So they have a good day. And so they decide they're going to try and catch up because they're feeling um guilty and maybe ashamed about various things they've not been able to do or that they wanted to do and they're feeling good and they act, they end up overdoing it um, and then they end up with a flare-up of symptoms so increased fatigue brain fog whatever um, then they've got to rest again so they have some bad days and then they end up feeling or can feel stupid embarrassed more guilt more shame and they've had to do better but they kind of end up going round and round in circles um, and what's actively needed or actually needed um, is some pacing so um, one of the things I have to do with my own health condition is frequent breaks doing things in small chunks and where you're kind of increasing activities the increases have to be very gradual and for some people whose fatigue is really severe you're literally talking about increments of one minute it's kind of it's really small um so it, it again this has to be tailored for individuals but the boom and bust cycle isn't good because you end up having more bad days than good days pacing and and slowing things down is actually really beneficial in terms of making your, your energy go further um there's different kinds of um restoration that we need carla's already talked about sleep um Resting isn't the same thing as sleeping. So yes, sleeping is hugely beneficial and all the things that Carla said. Yes, totally. Um, but we also need other kinds of rest. So we need physical rest in order to reduce tension, to induce calm. And there's various ways we can do that. So yoga, etc. We also need mental rest to calm the busyness of our mind. So lots of people have you know, a a brain that's kind of a bit like a hamster on a wheel it's just going round and round and round and it's worse when they try and get into bed at night or when they wake up in the early hours of the morning practicing during the day doing doing some kind of meditation spending some time outside having some tech free time um is really important in terms of if you practice those skills during the day it makes it that much easier to access them and calm your mind at night when you want to sleep and it improves your sleep um sensory resting so that's to reduce overstimulation and feelings of overwhelm that come from having too much coming at you um so some people not everybody actually do need to have some time on their own in silence every day um some people that that kind of i call it kind of like sunday morning feeling where you're in still in your pajamas and kind of pottering around that kind of thing having something like that at some point is is really beneficial um the best proponent of this that I know um, is Elaine Aaron. She has a website called The Highly Sensitive Person. There's a test you can take to see how sensitive you are. Um, and she also has lots and lots of resources around helping people who have um, 
issues with becoming overstimulated physically, mentally or, or sensorily um, to help them kind of manage it, understand it, manage it, reduce it and therefore have better quality of life. Um, active restoration is already is, is also important, as Carla has already mentioned, you need to have hobbies, interests and playtime. Um, they don't actually have to be. I, I remember when I was doing my sixth form application to go to university, I was being I was kept being told you have to have interesting hobbies and interesting things that make you sound like you're a really interesting person. But actually, you don't. As long as it makes your heart sing, it really doesn't matter. It's good. It's up to you. It's your life that they ha it has to have meaning for you. And the most recent research that looks at the benefits of how we spend our time that's intended to feed us is is meaning for the individual. It has to matter to you. It's got to have meaning to you. So it might be the latest thing that's doing the rounds, like hula hoops or whatever back in the, whenever it was, the 80s. But if that's not your thing, it's fine. You don't have to do that. You can do whatever works for you in terms of having your um, your hobbies, interests and playtime. And um, the bottom one, getting curious and living in the moment, that's good for all of us, regardless of what hobby, interest or playtime we're, we're doing. Um, and trying to pick one positive moment from every day is, is really useful. It fosters a sense of gratitude um, and appreciation. And that acts as a very, very gentle counter to anxiety and stress. Um, so you're not actually pushing the anxiety and stress away, but you are acknowledging that actually there are still things that you can appreciate and enjoy despite difficulties. Um, and that's important. So mindfulness. Um, often described as mindfulness meditation, but you don't actually have to do it as a form of meditation. Um, it's about how you engage with the world. So it's about having friendly curiosity towards yourself, the others in the world. And that's the thing I like most about it, the friendly curiosity. Um, it encourages you to be both mentally and physically present in your life. And what that means is when we're doing routine activities, like the washing up or driving, it makes me worried but it's what we do we're driving and our mind wanders you're not actually paying attention to the road you're thinking about whatever that's coming up that's worrying you or something that's happened in the past that's worrying you so you're physically present in the car but mentally absent mindfulness encourages you to be physically and mentally present in this moment at this point in time um you should do it and just try it and see what happens you don't set any expectations about what's going to happen you just try it and see what will happen you should practice it every day. Um, I recommend if you've never done anything like this before for really short amounts of time. So I, I usually recommend informal practice, which is why there are pictures of tea and coffee on there. So when you have a drink and staying hydrated is really important if you're prone to brain fog um, and fatigue. Pay proper attention to the first couple of sips of the drink that you have. What colour is it? What mug is it in? How heavy is it when you pick it up? At what point do you start to feel the heat from the mug as you as it approaches your face? At what point do you start to smell it? Um, is it the same colour as the last one you made or the one you made yesterday? So actually properly paying attention to it, just to the first couple of sips. Drinking an entire mug like that would drive you loopy loose. So it's just little and often and doing that regularly through the day. Drinks are easy to do it with because you have them regularly through the day. If you pay attention, properly pay attention to a couple of sips of every drink that you have during the day, it will make a big difference. And if you want to learn more about mindfulness, um, the best resource, the best book is by John Kabat-Zinn, um, who is the father of mindfulness practice um, and his book, Full Catastrophe Living, which is where he describes it and how it was evolved and all the different components and encourages you to play with it and find out what works for you. And that's the key to all of this. So for brain fog, that's a picture. I I love this. I found this and it looks a lot like me with the purple glasses. I have some purple glasses. And yeah, I do have 50 shades of brain fog at times um, as part of my health condition. Um, so staying hydrated, nutrition is really important. Watching your posture when you're tired, we tend to slump. And if you slump, that compresses your chest area. And that means that it changes the balance of oxygen that's getting to your brain and that in itself can actually make you feel tired and make the brain fog worse reducing the stress using lists i have a desk diary with all the lists on of things i need to do i don't remember anything i it, i have it all written down and it takes the strain off doing things one thing at a time 
rather than trying to have try and juggle plates. That's not not good if you've got brain fog. Um, slowing down. The irony is on the days when I slow down and potter through my day, I get so much more done than on the days when I rush around like an idiot. Um, and giving yourself regular breaks during the day. Um, clearing your head, mint or citrus scents can actually help um, refresh um, your head, particularly I, I need them in the afternoon, but other people may need them in the morning um, or indeed later on in the day. Um, change the way you talk to yourself. The, the kind of negative self-talk we have doesn't help. Spending time with your friends and Kaizen, the, the gentle art of continuous improvement. Um, rather than trying to make whole life changes, we do better if we nibble around the edges and make little changes day by day. Um, best person I know who writes about this is Sabina Brennan. She has a book called Beating Brain Fog. It takes you through 30 days um, and looks at the key components of understanding what brain fog is and the different things that you can do nutritionally in terms of improving your sleep and so on. Um, and at the end, she shares the, um, the daily program that she uses herself and invites you to personalize it for, your, for yourself. Um, so self-coaching, we can all do this. And I keep forgetting this slide does this. We talk to ourselves in unhelpful ways. We tend to disaster think and we believe we know what's going to happen in the future. Mm. Um, it's helpful if we can develop more compassionate ways of talking to ourselves, like we actually like ourselves. There's some important research by um, Paul Gilbert that talks about how if someone talked to you in real life, the way you talk to yourself in your head, it would activate your stress response and you'd want to get away from them. So you need to talk to yourself nicely um, and be on your own team. Um, being factual, so not getting ahead of yourself, staying with the, with the here and now. The other way you can think about this, which is the simple form, and I have a thing above my desk that says, which wolf are you feeding? So are you talking to yourself and feeding the wolf of grievances? Or are you feeding yourself or yeah, talking to yourself and, and feeding the wolf of miracles and possibilities? So this comes from um, an... Indian American story about an old gentleman who's talking to his grandson and he says within you there are two wolves and they're always fighting and then the young young lad says okay so which wolf wins and the old man says the one that you feed and so the which wolf are you feeding really matters in terms of mental health um, and well-being so what helps in summary kindness and compassion the way we talk to ourselves, living mindfully, staying in the moment um, as often as we can, developing our inner strengths. There is some good research that says that the more that we use our, our key strengths, our top three key strengths, the less stress and anxiety we experience, the better our confidence and our self-esteem and um, our quality of life um, and developing gratitude and appreciation. Um, so I've got a slide that gives you some ideas for key strengths but it's okay if yours aren't on there so if you're really good at being organized happy days put whatever your key strength is it doesn't matter what it is but the more you can use it the better and then reflective so i do this um and have been doing it for a very long time how's today gone have i been able to act in accordance with the values that matter to me how i want to be in the world with myself and with other people? Have I been able to use my key strengths? What one small thing do I need to do differently tomorrow? And it's important that you finish with the gratitude and appreciation. So what am I pleased about? Three things. Um, again, best person I know to talk about Kaizen and this idea of continuous improvements is Anna Katharina Schaffner. Um, and her book was published last week. Um, it's called Exhausted and A to Z for the Weary. And that is it from me. And I've talked too long as usual. Oh, that was lovely, Sue. I really enjoyed that. And I hope everyone else did too. Okay. So I've been trawling through the questions and trying to um, trying to get a flavour. Um, as I know that time's short and people will want to run off and make tea and put children to bed and things like that. So um, one of the questions that seemed to come up quite a lot was um, 
about people who've had total thyroidectomies and um one of the questions is kind of a, a three-part thing and that i probably will direct this to um carla um one of the questions with total thyroidectomy is that um there was a couple of comments saying that they felt that there was not much support generally around thyroidectomy um and they didn't know where to go for support afterwards um and uh linking in with that was a question about whether people needed to supplement um with other medications such as selenium or vitamins um would you be able to answer that one yeah so um I think I think sometimes part of the problem is that the decision for a total thyroidectomy might be made relatively quickly. And for for some people who are coming at the total thyroidectomy, let's say for instance they're having it for Graves disease, you know, they they might have already done some reading about it and they might be sick of having multiple episodes of Graves disease. And actually they're very happy to have a thyroidectomy. And so it's very straightforward, no complications, and life goes on for them. But I think there certainly are people who maybe are not aware that this might be potentially a treatment that's going to be offered to them. And maybe they haven't had enough time to think about it or they haven't had enough time to talk to, to their clinician about it. So um, I think it's really helpful, actually, and I think it's completely fine for somebody maybe to have an initial consultation talking about the pyridectomy. I usually give people written information regarding the thyroidectomy. There's very good information available from BTF, but also from um, the British Association of Endocrine and Thyroid Surgeon, B-A-E-T-S. You can go on their website and they have information about thyroidectomy. And I think people should take a little bit of time to read that and have a think about it. And it, I often say to people, you know, I think this is a good option for you, but I'm very happy for you to come back and have all the same questions again. And we can talk about it all again. You can bring a, bring somebody with you and we can talk about it again because it can be a really big decision for somebody. And I think they need to be, they, they need to be happy that it's right for them. And I, I think that's the case for anything we do in medicine. I don't think it's the right thing to say, well, this is what you need to have. End of story. Because it really should be a decision that you make with the patient. So I think that that helps. A couple of visits trying to get a bit of information from your for your for yourself from reputable sources and um and then after you leave the ward if you've had your total thyroidectomy to have support from the nurses about how to manage your wound and to have a number to call if you have questions that often really helps and helps relieve anxiety and then the other question is about vitamins so i don't tend to tell people they need to take vitamins if they've got any thyroid disease however Many people wish to take multivitamins, which is absolutely fine. That's uh, no problem. Um, I do tend to suggest to people if they're if they're not feeling quite right, maybe to think about taking vitamin D over winter. Uh, we're very deficient in here. I am sitting in the dark. <laughs> we're very deficient in vitamin D, so I tell them to take maybe eight hundred to a thousand units daily. And winter, really, for us, is October to March. <laughs> So I do say to take vitamin D, but not necessarily anything else. Lovely. Thank you. And actually linking in with that, Sue, is that um, quite a few people have been um, talking about how to how to get themselves heard in consultations. And I just wondered if you you've given us lots of tips about how to look after ourselves and taking little small pieces of, um, you know, not trying to overwhelm ourselves with exercising all day long and just doing little bits at a time. But I just wondered if you have any advice for people who who just don't feel that they're being heard at the moment, apart from uh, people have suggested, you know, improved training for clinicians and GPs. But um, have you got any advice? Um, yes, we do need to have improved training for clinicians. Um, in fact, I've, I've spent the last three days reading um, a PhD thesis, which is it documents the problems that a particular patient population have because they aren't listened to. And so their process of diagnosis takes a very, very long time because 
all of the the kind of common things have to be ruled out first because that's how medicine generally is practiced and that and at one level you kind of see yeah that makes sense because it is more likely to be a, a commoner thing but it means that you end up with people going back and back and back and starting to feel like a nuisance and then wondering if they're they're kind of do they need to talk to someone else and having to try and um I was, I was reading another thing the other day where a, a doctor was talking about how um, he's glad that he's leaving medicine because these days people self um, diagnose and then go and see their doctor and try and get their doctor to agree with them. And actually they find that some doctors find that difficult. I think we have um, an inherent tension within our health service that on one level, we're told we have to take responsibility for our health. But on the other hand, um, we we have a situation where we have various, you, know, you have to have tests, you have to have multiple consultations, et cetera. One of the things that I found really helpful that I do with a lot of my clients who have chronic health conditions is keeping a condition diary um, and recording symptoms and such, because actually when you go and see a, cons when you go and see a doctor, they can read faster than you can talk. And so if you have information that they can access easily and they can flick through and ask you questions about it, you can cover a lot more information in that consultation and provide them with information about what's happening to you holistically. And they can access it a lot quicker and come to, to conclusion quicker if they, they've got it, it just speeds the whole thing up. So, yeah, I kind of advocate for patient diaries and. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, I'd also advocate taking someone with you because sometimes it's um yeah. if you if you can because sometimes two heads are better than one and sometimes you're so busy um zoning out on a particular answer for a question that you forget to concentrate not forget to concentrate but you you're so you busy concentrating on that point that you forget to concentrate on the rest of the consultation. Um, and it, and it does happen if you're prone to brain fog. It's a really yes. good idea to take someone yeah. with you. Um, yeah, yeah. And if you're very stressed about something, stress affects your short term memory um, and someone can tell you something and it'll go in one ear and straight out the other. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. And it could be something like trying to find a car parking space for the appointment and you're running a couple of minutes late and um, that that can actually actually absolutely throw you. Um, I'm aware of the time that it's um, just a little over seven. So if I may take um, license, I'm I'm going to just try and um, cover a couple of areas, um, uh, maybe going back to some of the practical issues, um, for instance, we've had a question, um, Carla, if I may refer to you, we've had a question um, where um, somebody is unsure about taking, when they are taking thyroxine, whether they should be doing their blood tests before or afterwards, and would that make any difference? So there's that kind of thing. And also um, uh, uh, another um, of our participants tonight has said that, um, she has a child who's taking thyroxine, but doesn't feel she's getting any better. So there's a, a couple of patients also online who are saying, how do they, if if they don't feel um, quite well, or if they feel that their TSH is in range, but they don't feel quite on the ball, how do they communicate that? So sorry, that's a two part question there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm. So first of all, with regards to thyroxine and timing of blood, so it doesn't matter. So whether you take thyroxine or don't take thyroxine that day, it won't make any difference to your TSH and T4. Uh, marginal difference, if anything, but really not much of a difference. So so it doesn't really matter. So that's fine. Um, it's uh, with regard to the child on thyroxine. So that's tough to hear. I'm sure tough to see as a parent as well. Um, so hopefully it's early days and maybe the child just isn't quite on the right dose. So the key thing for the moment is to try and take it correctly. So it's worth stating because many patients will not have heard this, but it's important to take thyroxine early in the morning. So first thing in the morning, empty stomach, just with water, no tea or coffee, no food for at least half an hour. Um, in the studies, there can be some interference with absorption, even up to an hour. But in practical terms, I find that really difficult to do. So if you can't do up to an hour, that's okay. Try to do it up to, uh, don't eat it for half an hour. And usually that works absolutely fine. Try to avoid any iron 
or you know, any supplements with iron or uh, supplements that are iron only, avoid those for at least four hours and also avoid anything with calcium as well for a similar time. So if you're taking any multivitamins, anything with iron or calcium, take those with your lunch or dinner because they should be taken ideally with food. Um, did I address everything or was there? Oh, if somebody still has symptoms, they feel unwell. Yeah. So somebody says they're on thyroxine, their TSH looks good, but they just don't feel right. So this is something that we do encounter, unfortunately, in a subset of people who are on thyroxine for hypothyroidism. And so then if that was the case, then, the, you know, my first protocol would be to go to your GP. And I think it's a great idea what Sue just said is to just write down your symptoms, have a little think about how long they've been going on and maybe think to yourself, what are the worst symptoms? Because they're the kind of things that we think about. So it's really helpful if you have that ready for us. And um, and then what we do is we are trained to take good history and examination and we'd send off some additional blood tests to look for common causes of your uh, additional symptoms. So it will vary from person to person. That's usually what we'll do. If we don't find an explanation, then that's when we're really talking about things that we can do in our lifestyle to try and optimize our well-being, which are the things that we were focusing on today. Great, thank you. And I've just got one final one, and I, I'm sure lots of people are very um, cross that we've not been able to cover. I, I'm really sorry because they're over um, 50 questions on the on the on the Q and A that um, are there. Um, obviously, some of them can be addressed by the British Thyroid Foundation, and I know they'll do their best. Julia will probably um, talk to that um, after we've finished. But um, finally, I just wanted to ask Sue, so we we have um, we have patients who are very young um, in middle ages and and also elderly, and I just wondered if um, particularly those patients and participants who are um, perhaps not as mobile as they um, would like to be, what what you would say to those, um, what you would advise those people, please? In respect of what specifically, sorry? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, in, in the respect of looking after themselves, trying to keep healthy and um, look after themselves, their well-being. Mm. I think it's particularly challenging if you're young because the biographical disruption happens so early um, in your life and it can feel like your whole life has been thrown off course. It's good to find someone that you can talk to um, about that um, if necessary. Um, it can also be traumatic for, for older people and they can also need um, support and need someone um, to talk to. And I think we we underestimate sometimes the power and the benefit of talking to other people. Now that can be friends and family, although sometimes they don't understand and that can increase the, the sense of isolation. Um, some GPs have got um, access to counsellors. They can refer you into counselling and some hospitals um, have good clinical psychology departments and you can also get good counselling and support through them as well. And don't forget, there are a, an awful lot of third sector charities like the British Thyroid Foundation that offer lots of help and support to people. Um, so it's, I think, yeah, I think one of the things that makes it worse is feeling that you're on your own and it's only you um, and, and having meaningful connections with other people and having somewhere you can talk about it is, is really important. Um, so, yeah, sharing it and, and asking for help and getting advice to kind of and to work on those little those bits kind of little by little. Fabulous. Thank you so much. That's really, really um, great answer. Um, I am going to pass over to um, back to Julia um, to, to finish off this meeting. Um, I really do apologise for all those questions that we weren't able to answer. Um, obviously, there were a lot of individuals who had um, personal um, issues with their particular um, medical teams. Um, so um, I will defer to Julia. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greta, and 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 um, to Carla and Sue for such interesting and really thought provoking presentations. You've given us lots to think about. And a special thanks to Greta for doing such a good job of sifting through all the, <clears throat> the huge number of questions. Um, and, and having to think so quickly on the spot to kind of put them to the speakers. I, I particularly like 
the discussion about inanition um, and the idea that it's important to make sure that we avoid starvation, soul foods are things that are important to our lives and how it's important to find the right balance <clears throat> of all the um, different aspects of our life that are so important. And I also love your wolves, Sue, and how it's important to feed the wolf of wolves of the wolf of miracles and possibilities and to avoid overfeeding the wolf of grievances and make sure the right one wins. I love that idea. If you joined late or if there are bits of the uh, webinar that you'd like to go back to again, the webinar was recorded and it will be on our uh, on our website and on our YouTube channel probably from tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that. Um, BTF is a is a small charity and we're always we we rely on fundraising and donations to to continue our work. So just a reminder, if you would like to support us and enable us to continue events like this free of charge, please do consider making a donation to the BTF or, or joining the BTF as a member, however small it would be much appreciated. And you're also uh, very welcome to give us any feedback about this webinar. Um, and there's a feedback form that will come out to you in the next day or so. So many thanks to our wonderful speakers. We really know how we know how busy you are and we really, really appreciate you giving up your time for us, especially after a long day's work, eating into your evening. We're very grateful you found the time to, to support us in this way. And finally, a big thank you to everybody who joined this meeting tonight. We really uh, valued the knowing that you were there and all the questions that you put to us to keep us thinking. So please stay in touch with the BTF and we look forward to seeing you again at future events. Thank you very much. Good evening.